My name is Professor Philip Clark, and I'm Director of the Health Economics Research Centre at the University of Oxford. I'd like to introduce today's course, Introduction to Health Economic Evaluation, and in particular, focus on Module 1, which is Introduction to Key Health Economic Concepts. Today's session will last approximately an hour, and it will cover the basics to, of health economics and economic evaluation that has been around for the last 50 or so years, but particularly has gained prominence in countries such as the United Kingdom in the last 20 years, where it has become critical to decision making of what technologies and healthcare we choose to maximise value for money in the healthcare system. What we hope you will get out of today's module is an introduction to the language of economics and economic evaluation, an understanding of how we evaluate costs and benefits of interventions, and an appreciation of how economics is used by decision makers in health services and in pharmaceutical and, and medical technology industries. So what will be covered in this first session? Overall, our aim is to give you an introduction to some of the key concepts of health economics, which will serve as a basis for the material you will cover in the other three sessions. We begin by taking a look at some international comparisons. In particular, what different countries spend on healthcare? How has this changed? Why has this changed? And does this matter? So what do different countries spend on healthcare? One way to represent this is to have a look at the proportion of health expenditure relative to the total size of the economy as measured by a country's GDP. So one might ask the question, how does the United Kingdom compare with other countries in terms of its overall health expenditure? Or which country spends the most on healthcare? As you can see, we can you get both of these uh, answers to both of these questions from this graph. On the horizontal axis or x-axis, we have the total gross domestic product per person as expressed in what's known as international dollars that are just for purchasing power parity so that each country's income is standardized to correct for price differences and thus ensure comparability. So for example, a, pound, a, a British pound that is spent in Mexico will buy more than a pound that is spent in the UK. On the vertical axis, what we're measuring is the proportion or percent of gross domestic product that is devoted to, to healthcare. So if you have a look at the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom has a GDP uh, per capita after you adjust for purchasing power parity of approximately 43,800 international dollars, which is equivalent to around 33,500 pounds and spends about 10% of its GDP on healthcare. What you can also see is the United States spend, has a GDP of nearly 60,000 international dollars, but it spends more than 16% on healthcare. And one can also then look at different other countries and see how they compare. So what the previous slide has shown is health expenditure as a proportion of GDP at a single point in time, but we're also interested in the evolution of health spending in different countries over time. This is what this graph shows for four countries, the United States, Germany, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. And as you can see, there is an overall trend of increasing health expenditure as a proportion of GDP over time, although this is occurring at different rates in different countries. In particular, the United States, in the United States, health expenditure has risen much more rapidly compared with other countries in recent years. It's also important to note that health expenditure as a proportion of GDP is a ratio of overall expenditure to the overall size of the economy as measured by GDP. So for a country like Ireland, in the years after 2008, its health expenditure as a proportion of GDP rose rapidly, but not because it was necessarily spending more on health, but because its overall economy was contracting during that period. What are the reasons for rising health expenditure? Generally, four reasons are given. 
Firstly, demographic changes, in particular ageing populations, often lead to rises in health expenditure because we generally spend more on older people relative to younger people in terms of their overall health care. Secondly, there are new technologies. Now, this enables us often to, to produce better outcomes or treat diseases that we couldn't previously uh, tackle, but often this leads to rises in expenditure because often new technologies are more expensive than the ones they replaced. Thirdly, there are rising expectations of consumers who often demand more and better care than in previous generations. And finally, there is health sector inflation, where often the level of, of, of the price level in the healthcare sector rises faster than other parts of the economy. And this is largely due to the large proportion of health expenditure that is devoted to salaries compared with other sectors of the economy. So I suppose the question arises is as health expenditure rises over time, what are the outcomes produced and are we getting value for money? The answer to this question is not clear cut. As you can see from this graph, which plots healthy life expectancy in years and total health expenditure per, per capita, there is some relationship at lower levels of healthy life expectancy. In particular, a country like Turkey or Latvia, which has both has both lower, lower total health expenditure and uh, lower healthy life expectancy compared with, say, a country like the Czech Republic or Slovenia. Having said that, after the age of around 71 years and four or $5,000 worth of uh, health expenditure, there really isn't much relationship for other, uh, many other countries. Uh, and a country like the United States, as you can see, is, uh, it represents an outlier here in that it has one of the highest health expenditures, but also has a healthy life expectancy that's well below many other countries at comparable stages of development. Why is this the case? Well, in a country like the United States, one must remember we are taking the average and there are very many disparities, both in healthy life expectancy and in the overall level of health expenditure and access to care. And I think this explains the results in the US compared with other countries. So having looked at some international comparisons, it's now time to turn to economics and have a look at how economics is defined as a discipline and what are the fundamental economic problems we as a society face. How is economics formally defined? Well, at any point in time, resources are often fixed or finite. And so economists are interested in assisting individuals and societies to allocate scarce resources amongst competing alternative uses and also to work out how to, one might distribute the products of these resources within a society. Further, health economics is really a subdiscipline of economics that is focusing on the allocation of scarce resources within the healthcare sector and either for, to treat people who are sick or in the promotion, maintenance and improvement of health. Resources are basically anything that is used to produce goods and services. This includes time, labor, knowledge, ability, capital, as well as natural resources. Scarcity arises because there aren't enough resources to satisfy the infinite number of demands and needs in a society. Hence, choices have to be made about the use of scarce resources. Further, scarcity means that when you use your resources for one purpose, for example, the purchase of an expensive new drug, it may have an opportunity cost in that those resources can't be allocated somewhere else. And often what we use to value a, a, a resources is the potential benefits in terms of what could be gained by using these resources for another purpose or the best alternative purpose. So the fundamental economic problem is the allocation of scarce resources. Often this is done by the market in many uh, economies, but when it comes to healthcare, uh, markets often fail, which means we use other mechanisms to allocate healthcare. Why healthcare markets fail? Well, firstly, there is uncertainty. People don't know when they will fall ill and when they will require care, nor do they often know the effectiveness 
of it, the treatments they take. Secondly, there is asymmetric information. This arises because patients often know that they have less information on which to make decisions than uh, healthcare professionals, and they are looking to these professionals to act as agents for them. Thirdly, there are many monopolies in the healthcare system. For example, pharmaceutical manufacturers often apply for patents to uh, protect a particular drug and give them a legal monopoly to produce that drug over a limited period. Fourthly, there are often externalities in that a cons the consumption of a healthcare by an individual may benefit or harm others. A good example of an external benefit is the protection a vaccination affords to other individuals in terms of reducing the rate of transmission of the disease. A potential external cost is antibiotic resistance in that if someone uses antibiotics, potentially they, the growing resistance creates a negative externality in that others may not be able to use those antibiotics in future. Also beyond these four reasons, there are clearly other issues such as equity of allocation in healthcare that become critical in the way we often allocate resources. So we must therefore use non-market methods to allocate many healthcare goods and services. What are the potential resource allocation mechanisms for allocating healthcare? Well, some have suggested the idea we might use need, although it's often hard to separate out a person's needs from their wants or their preferences for healthcare. People have also suggested we may discriminate against certain groups, for example, provide less care to smokers, although again, it's unclear on what basis we would do this. People have also suggested that we might use a notion of personal merit or social esteem, but again, what would be the criteria and how would you allocate uh, healthcare resources on those criteria? There have also been suggestions and uh, applications of random allocation, and this arises often when you need to ration goods. But again, one needs to get a society to accept uh, a lottery for allocating healthcare. Finally, people have suggested perhaps more an ability to pay could be used. And of course, this does apply when there are, as it were, free markets in healthcare, but often these are a very small part of the healthcare sector compared with the allocation by government uh, of, of uh, public care. So in terms of the sorts of allocation mechanisms we will focus on here in this course is basically the idea that one might choose the lowest cost treatments. One might choose treatments that are the effective or the most effective. And then one might bring both of these concepts of costs and effects together to look at the most cost effective treatments. And this is really where I think we use what one might term as economic based medicine. In the previous section, we looked at international comparisons, discussed what is economics as a whole, and also why the health sector in particular has been the focus of so much research. In this section, we shall look closely at economic evaluation, what it is, why it is needed, and what it entails. So what is economic evaluation? If you remember, we live in a world of scarce resources, including scarce healthcare resources. Consequently, if we spend money on one intervention, we cannot spend it on anything else. So for example, if we buy anti-cancer drugs, we will have less money to spend on cardiovascular medication. Our aim, therefore, is to use the available resources to maximize the health gains. To do so, we compare different interventions which may include a no-intervention scenario, in terms of their costs and effectiveness. So the formal definition of economic evaluation is the comparative analysis of alternative causes of action in terms of both their costs and their consequences. And the allocation system based on this concept is meant to be an explicit and objective way of making choices. 
there are several types of economic evaluation. And the difference comes in how we measure effectiveness, i.e. outcomes. The cost component is the same across all types. As I will be talking through each approach, feel free to pause and think about the pros and cons of each type. And also, which type may be more suitable specifically for your context. I will mention a few points to consider, but the list will be far from exhaustive. The first type of economic evaluation I will mention is the cost consequences analysis. In this type of analysis, cost and consequences of the alternative therapies are calculated and reported in a disaggregated manner. It is then up to decision makers to interpret, synthesize or weight the diverse outcomes as appropriate. In this approach, of course, it is assumed that decision makers can interpret and use such results consistently and that they are the best people to decide on the relative ways placed on different outcomes. The next type I will mention is the cost minimization analysis. In this type of analysis, it is assumed that health outcomes are identical for all treatments under consideration, both in terms of efficacy and safety. And then costs are compared and the least costly option is adopted. As simple as it sounds, um, I should say that cost minimization analyses are rarely appropriate and are not considered to be full economic evaluations. As you will learn later in the course, it is important to consider the joint distribution of costs and effects, not just cost and effects standalone. Um, the next type of analysis I will mention the cost effectiveness analysis. In it, we measure health outcomes in natural units and calculate an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, such as cost per life year gained or cost per additional case detected. In the cost utility analysis, multiple outcomes are combined into a single metric, such as quality adjusted life year or quality. You will learn more about qualities later in the, in the course, uh, but a notable advantage of this approach is that it permits comparisons across diverse disease areas and encompasses both length and quality of life. And finally, the cost benefit analysis. Um, in this analysis, monetary values are placed on health outcomes by assessing society's willingness to pay for particular benefits. Costs of new interventions are then compared with the monetary value of the benefits, and if the benefits outweigh the costs, treatments are adopted. In this course, we will mainly be talking about cost utility analysis, which is one of the most commonly used type of analysis in economic evaluation. We will also briefly touch upon cost-benefit analysis. Remember that in economic evaluation, we always compare one intervention with another and calculate the incremental cost-effectiveness ratio. However, even though each ICER incremental cost-effectiveness ratio is calculated based on the difference in costs and benefits between two treatments, you can in fact have as many comparators as you like in your economic evaluation. It is essential, however, to use an appropriate comparator. In fact, analysis using an inappropriate comparator, uh, for example, a comparator that's not relevant for the country of interest, such as the UK, is one of the main sources of uncertainty in nicest technology appraisal decisions for cancer drugs. And of course, uncertainty can lead to the appraisal committee being unable to recommend a drug for routine use in the NHS. How do you choose the comparator? Well, the list of comparators that you evaluate must include a treatment or treatments that are most likely to be replaced by the therapy that you are evaluating. So, for example, if you are evaluating a new treatment for first-line treatment of hypertension, then your comparators must include the drug that is currently the market leader in this population. And if you're assessing a treatment for a condition from which most patients receive no therapy or there's currently no treatment, then appropriate comparator might be no treatment or palliative care or best supportive care. If you're not sure which comparators should be used, speak to clinicians and review sales data to choose the best comparator for economic evaluation. 
So let's see in a bit more detail how does economic evaluation work. The framework we use is actually very simple, but it can be very powerful. And just to reiterate, the main aim of our analysis is to compare interventions in terms of costs and outcomes. So we perform an incremental analysis where the difference in costs of the alternative interventions is compared with the difference in outcomes. So to see it graphically, so say we have one intervention, which we call intervention one. We calculate its costs and effects. And then we look at the alternative intervention, which we say call intervention two. And then we calculate costs and effects for the intervention two. So with this data, we can then calculate the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, for which we look at the difference in costs of the two interventions, i cost one minus cost two, and divide it by the difference of effects, i effect one minus effect two. So the end result of this comparison would usually be a figure which gives the incremental cost effectiveness of the new treatment compared to the old treatment, where the old treatment may be no treatment at all. So this figure may now be plotted on this graph, which is commonly used in the decision-making process. Now, some of you may be familiar with this figure. Even if you're not, this is honestly not as scary as it looks. So let's try to split it into small ingredients. The point C in the center is the starting point. This is the world with only the existing treatment in place, for the comparator as we know it. And remember, the comparator could be the current market leader, or no treatment at all. On the horizontal x-axis, we plot comparative effectiveness. On the vertical y-axis, we plot comparative cost. Now, when we compare two alternatives, there are four different scenarios that may come up, which correspond to the four quadrants of the graph. I will go through all four of them, and as I do this, feel free to pause and think about how each position in each of these quadrants may affect the decision-making conclusion. So for two of these quadrants, the decision is quite straightforward. If we are in the northwest quadrant, i.e. top left, then the new treatment is more costly and less effective. So a decision is quite simple to make. The existing treatment clearly dominates. Similarly, if we are in the southeast quadrant, i.e. bottom right, the new treatment is more effective and less costly, so it dominates and therefore should be adopted. The decision is less straightforward in the other two quadrants. In the southwest quadrant, i.e. bottom left, new treatment is less costly, but also less effective. And similarly, in the top right corner, i.e. northeast, the new treatment is more effective, but it's also more costly. And so in these two quadrants, the decision is not as straightforward, and either treatment could be chosen depend on where you draw the line, in terms of what you're willing to pay to gain extra effectiveness, or the saving that you're willing to accept to forgo a degree of effectiveness. And there will be a line, which is the maximum you're willing to spend to accept for a given amount of effectiveness, or possibly the meaning saving you're willing to accept for a given amount of effectiveness. So the cost effectiveness figure we came up with in the framework on the previous slides will be plotted somewhere here. So for example, this is the red dot on the graph. And a decision will be suggested, depending on whether boundaries on cost effectiveness have been drawn. And we'll talk about this more in the next sections. This concludes this section. Hello. I'm Liz Stokes and I'm going to present the final part of Module 1.
You've just been introduced to economic evaluation. We are now going to very briefly consider a few issues surrounding economic evaluation. Firstly, some considerations when designing the evaluation and then what information this requires. The first thing to consider when designing an economic evaluation is who is this for? Typically, the target audience will be a decision maker. For example, in England, this might be NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. The economic evaluation might provide evidence and feed into a NICE technology appraisal or the writing of a clinical guideline. It is also important to consider and follow any guidelines relevant to your evaluation. There are guidelines designed to raise standards and consistency in the conduct and reporting of economic evaluations. The Consolidated Health Economic Evaluation Reporting Standards Statement, the CHEERS Statement, was published in multiple journals in 2013. The objective of the analysis will clearly influence the design of the economic evaluation. The target population needs to be defined. Who will be included and excluded? The details of the intervention need to be defined. What will the intervention be exactly? Where will it be delivered? By whom will it be delivered? What will the comparator be? What is currently usual practice? And what perspective will you take in your analysis? Whose costs and benefits will be captured? You will need to decide on a primary outcome measure for the economic evaluation and the whole approach to costing and valuing outcomes. Will you conduct an economic evaluation alongside a randomised controlled trial or will you design and analyse a health economic model? Another important consideration is the time frame over which you capture costs and outcomes, the time horizon. We will discuss all of these considerations in more detail in subsequent modules. The choices you make in designing the economic evaluation can affect the outcomes. To ensure a level playing field, decision makers such as NICE have defined their reference case. This sets out the standard approach that they expect to see. For example, it defines the perspective to be taken, the preferred outcome measure and the time horizon. This is to improve consistency and comparability between evaluations. So what information do we need to be able to derive this incremental cost effectiveness ratio, the ISA? Firstly, we need data on resource use and costs. There are various categories of resource that are of interest to us. One is healthcare resource use, for example, as a result of the intervention. This must include all resource use that will differ between the treatments being compared, including the treatment, managing side effects and the management of any events avoided through treatment. Other resource use that may require consideration includes productivity costs. These occur when the productivity of an individual, particularly for paid work, is affected by illness, treatment or death. We also need information on costs to combine with this resource use data. The concept of opportunity cost is important, as was highlighted earlier. Remember, the presence of scarce resources means that every time we spend money on one thing, we must always give up some benefits that could have been achieved by spending it on something else. And opportunity cost captures the cost of these sacrifices. So the opportunity cost of treating one patient is that we can't use that money or that bed or that 10 minutes of a doctor's time to treat another patient. Let's consider informal carers. At first glance, the cost of using informal carers to look after an elderly person, for example, is very small for the NHS compared to managed care. However, the opportunity cost of the carer's time needs to be considered. What they could be earning in formal work or the cost of their foregone leisure time. So the concept of opportunity cost 
is a way of ensuring that all costs are considered, both direct costs, say to the NHS, and indirect costs to the carers. And we need to consider the timing of resource use and assess exactly how far in advance these costs are incurred. Now, next year or in 10 years time, and decide how long of a time period our economic evaluation will cover. Should we only consider costs now, or should we also include future costs? We also need information on outcomes. We could measure outcomes in natural units, for example, the number of cases detected or the number of symptom-free days. Another option is to use a measure such as the quality, quality adjusted life years, which enables both length and quality of life to be considered. Or we could attempt to value benefits in monetary terms. We could also take into account the fact that as a condition develops, people pass through several different health states, all of which have a differing impact on them. And again, we need to consider when outcomes occur and which outcomes we're going to consider, just those occurring now or those also occurring in the future. This is just a brief introduction to the information requirements of economic evaluation and the remaining modules will consider all of these issues in more detail. Having collected and combined information on costs and outcomes, we need to be able to interpret our results. What is the maximum acceptable ISA that suggests an intervention is cost effective? Arbitrary rules of thumb are used in several countries to define a maximum acceptable ISA. NICE guidance states that in general, interventions with an ISA of less than £20,000 per quali gained are considered to be cost effective. Above an ISA of £30,000 per quali gained, advisory bodies need to make an increasingly stronger case for supporting the intervention as an effective use of NHS resources. In Ireland, this range is 20,000 to 45,000 euros. And in Canada, this range is wider still, from 20,000 to 100,000 Canadian dollars. However, these ranges are not strictly adhered to and some would argue even the lower bound estimates are too high and so not efficient. We will return to this in module four. To conclude this module, I would like to share an example with you. Now we know what sort of information we require to calculate cost effectiveness results, let's look at an example of a cost effectiveness analysis using the framework you saw earlier. This example is taken from a study conducted at HERC evaluating the cost effectiveness of total knee replacement. Total knee replacement is a high volume surgical procedure with relatively high costs. To cut costs for the NHS, providers at the time proposed to limit access to the procedure on the basis of cost effectiveness. The comparator is no total knee replacement. Patients who would in principle be eligible for total knee replacement, but do not undergo it, receive pain medication and potentially walking aids. Total knee replacement costs approximately seven and a half thousand pounds and the average patient accrues three qualies within th five years after surgery. By contrast, patients without surgery do not incur any costs and the average patient accrues 1.75 qualies. The assumption of no additional costs is conservative since there might be costs for pain medication and walking aids. Without data on these costs, it is difficult to quantify them. The true ISA will likely be lower than the estimate presented here. Total knee replacement therefore costs an additional seven and a half thousand pounds and adds 1.25 qualies over five years compared to no total knee replacement. So comparing total knee replacement to no replacement gives us an incremental cost effectiveness ratio 
of around £5,600 for each quali gained. It is this £5,600 figure which is used in the decision-making process. Cost effectiveness can vary between patient groups. For example, total knee replacement for patients with a very high functional status costs around £6,900, so cheaper than for the average patient. Quali gains are also higher than for the average patient, with 3.7 qualies gained within five years. However, in this group, the quali gain without total knee replacement is also higher at around three qualies. This increases the ISA from £5,600 to £10,700 in this patient group. In this example, both for all patients and for the subgroup of patients with a high functional status, total knee replacement was both more costly and more effective than no total knee replacement. In both cases, therefore, we are in the northeast quadrant of the cost effectiveness plane. This is typical of new interventions we commonly evaluate. They are more effective, but also more costly. And we have to determine whether we are willing to pay for the additional health gain. So whether our estimates lie above or below this line. We will return to this in module four. In the subsequent modules of this course, we will consider how to identify measure and value outcomes how to identify measure and value resource use and how to present and interpret results. We also run a three day applied methods of cost effectiveness analysis course, which considers these areas in greater detail and also covers health economic modelling and extrapolation. That concludes the recorded presentations for this module. If you have any questions, do share them on the discussion page. We look forward to answering them in the live session.